Before I get started, I would like to extend my thanks to NIS America for providing a review copy of Cold Steel 4. Trails of Cold Steel 4 is releasing in just a few days, and I'm super excited for everyone to return to the country of Erebonia once more. As the final game in the Erebonia arc, it was nothing short of amazing and delivered a satisfying close to this chapter of the story. The storytelling was phenomenal, as expected of a Kiseki game, filled with suspense, anticipation, and surprises that kept me hooked all the way to the end. All the burning questions I had from the previous Cold Steel games were answered, and everything started to come together to form the bigger picture. But these new revelations also introduce new questions, and even more mysteries that will have to be revisited in the next game, like the secrets behind the devious organization Ouroboros. The story is getting much bigger in scope as the narrative expands, to the point where I worry that it will begin to be convoluted and confusing. It will be interesting to see how Falcom will continue to build upon the Kiseki universe, and if they'll one day turn into Kingdom Hearts where no one knows what's going on. Joking aside, Kiseki games have always had a solid story, but it's the amazing characters that make it all come together. Cool Steel 4 continues Reen in Class 7's struggle to lead Erebonia toward a brighter future despite the seemingly impossible obstacles blocking their path. They've come a long way since their introduction in the first game where they had some rough patches to overcome as students and as people. Some had secrets, some had biases that they projected onto others, and some had doubts that stunted their growth. The new Class 7 faced similar challenges, but regardless of the circumstances, everyone was able to overcome their differences and become not only close allies, but the best of friends. As much of a cliche as the power of friendship is, it's hard to hate on it, at least in this case because of everything they've been through together. Seeing it all come together in the end when everything is at stake and showing just how far they've come was very satisfying. As much as I like Class 7 and root for them, Cool Steel 4's most thrilling moments were seeing some of my personal favorite characters show up such as Estelle, Joshua, Lloyd, and Ellie, just to name a few. Sky was the game I started on, so the OG crew holds a much more special place in my heart compared to the other characters. Seeing Lloyd and the SSS gang be playable again was also exciting since Crossbell remains my favorite arc out of the three. Unfortunately, these characters were only playable for a small portion of the game and had a smaller skill set than what they had originally but just being able to use them more than makes up for it. If it wasn't for the amazing world building that Kiseki has done since the beginning, I doubt the impact of having these returning characters would have been as strong. I've mentioned this before and I'll say it again, because this is another thing I really like about Kiseki games. The world really feels alive. Even if the series has moved on to new heroes, the accomplishments and history of the older characters are never forgotten. There were always references and guest appearances that kept them relevant. This is even more apparent in Cold Steel 4 since this is where everything comes together. There were multiple mentions of the Hundred Days War, which was one of the focuses in the Libero arc, as well as mentions of the DG cult and the Croy history in the Crossbell arc. It's hard to say how much this would affect someone who has only played the Cold Steel series, but it's probably not too big a deal to miss those references since it's easy to follow along with what's happening. Accurate inferences can probably be made based on context as well. However, there is something to be said about being in the know and the feeling of being able to understand all the details that are revealed through the expositions. It makes all the time spent in the previous games and being able to connect all these events leading up to this final moment feel even more rewarding. Flavor NPCs also added more depth to the world by developing their own stories as the game progressed. Ron is a little girl living in St. Ark with her grandmother and was taught fortune telling by Traff. Throughout the game, she has to figure out how to deal with her parents who have gone through a personality change for the worse due to the current circumstances surrounding Erebonia. Charles is a devoted painter with a carefree attitude who reluctantly takes over his family's affairs since the previous head had to leave. These are just a couple of examples out of the many that show how much effort has been put into developing the setting and not just the main story. It's these instances that make the stakes feel meaningful because it shows just how much Class 7's actions affect the NPCs as well. The downside is that it was overwhelming for me to actually talk and keep up with all these side stories, especially once more of the world opened up. I had to take a few breaks because it was just too much to get through. When I tried to force myself to read through all the dialogue, I would just end up having to reread lines because my mind would just blank out from overload. JRPGs are known to have a lot of text in them, but I feel like Kiseki games have the most out of anything I've played. 
This is also one of the reasons it's not surprising to find some minor text errors, like typos or words extending past the dialog box. What matters most to me is the effort NIS puts into fixing those issues. Localization as a whole was fine. Everything was easy to understand and I had no problems following along with the many conversations I eavesdropped on. However, one thing did stand out. I don't remember how often words like and were used in the previous games, but it seems like they're more common in Cold Steel 4. Given the delinquent nature of some characters like Ash, it makes sense for them to speak this way, but it seems more excessive than it was before. Despite these things, the overall meaning wasn't lost. As for the rest of the game, seeing as it's the fourth installment in the series using the same game engine, not much has changed. Gameplay still uses the same old Kiseki formula that I've come to love. This consists of investigating an objective, completing said objective, then having a free day to do bonding events or explore in more detail. Combat is also very familiar and plays as it did in the third game. It's still turn-based with actions being selected with the four face buttons and D-pad to make it quicker to navigate. A few notable changes were made to equipment and combat. For equipment, the same subcourts can now be equipped by multiple party members, making builds slightly more flexible. In terms of combat, the BP limit has been increased to 7, making it much less punishing to use an all-out attack over a Brave Order. However, Brave Orders have also been toned down, but can be strengthened by completing trial chests scattered throughout the world. Besides that, a few quality of life additions have been incorporated for an improved gaming experience. The fast travel map now marks previously visited locales as new if there were any changes. This makes it much easier to know which NPCs have new dialogue, whereas older games required all areas to be checked to be 100% sure that nothing would be missed. Autosaves have also been implemented, which makes it much easier to reload to an earlier point. And the most impactful change for me is the ability to skip all cutscenes at once, instead of having to do it one by one, which makes getting through the game on subsequent playthroughs much quicker. Minigames also make their return and add variety to the activities that can be done. Blackjack and poker are available to play at the casino with useful prizes, and new cards have been added to my favorite Falcom card game, Vantage Master. But the cherry on top is the new minigame, Pom Pom Party, which plays a lot like Sega's Puyo Puyo Tetris, where colored poms have to be matched to perform combos. First making its debut in the unlocalized Trails to Azure, it can now be played officially for the first time in the West. It's a pretty fun game, but can be quite frustrating depending on how well the AI plays. But it's hard to stay mad with that catchy and upbeat tune playing in the background. The music continues to be one of the best parts of the game. The Falcom Sound Team JDK hasn't lost their touch when it comes to creating new spectacular music that brings out all the emotion of the story. No matter the situation, they always find a track that captures the tone of the game very well. Tracks like In the Shadow of History that have a soft piano melody pair really well with deep moments of reflection, while powerful songs like Ashita and Okiseki create hype for high stakes situations. It's amazing how they can evoke such emotion through their music. If you've come this far into the series, then I'm confident that you'll love this game as much as you loved the previous game. It delivers the same great experience that is expected of a Falcom game and does not disappoint. The Ariboni arc has been quite the journey and emotional roller coaster. I've enjoyed the series so much that I've platinumed all four games, which is not something I normally do. Cold Steel 4 is an epic end to an incredible saga. The bar is set pretty high, but there's still so much more of the world to discover, and I'm excited to see what's in store for us next. <laughs>